Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's webinar, Human Factors and Data Governance. It's part of a monthly webinar series sponsored by IDERA. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Ron Huzenga. Ron is the Senior Product Manager of Enterprise Architecture and Modeling at IDERA. Ron has over 30 years of business and IT experience as an executive and consultant spanning a diverse range of industries. His hands-on experience in large-scale enterprise initiatives includes enterprise and data architecture, business transformation, and software development. And his background provides practical, real-world insights into enterprise data architecture, business architecture, and governance initiatives. And with that, I will give the floor to get to Ron to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, except for those of you in the West Coast, and it's still good morning for you. Uh, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. Uh, obviously, uh, those of you that heard me before know I'm passionate about data governance and data architecture and those sorts of things. But really, where, where a lot of organizations really fail to uh, get the most out of their initiatives in terms of managing the people and motivating the people that are responsible for doing these things. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, kind of retrace some steps on uh, some things that we've seen in some previous uh, webcasts and that type of thing as, as a foundation. But then I'm really going to talk about the human factors or the human side of data governance and the types of things that we can do there. So to do that, I'm going to talk about some information capability uh, stats and findings from some different studies that have happened in the industry just to show how companies are doing as a whole these days. Then I'm going to talk about the need for enterprise architecture and governance as a foundation to really get us going very briefly. And I'm going to touch upon concepts like data maturity and process maturity that you've probably heard me talk about before as well. Very importantly, we really want to achieve business alignment so we get everything aligned with what the business strategy is and all departments in the business working together. And that includes our governance initiatives as well and how we motivate the people to accomplish the goals that we're trying to set out across the entire organization. Really what we need to do though is we really need to understand people or something that I call the people problem. And that means to be able to motivate people, to be able to get them to do the right things and to make them feel like they're, they belong and they're participating in these needs going forward is we need to understand the human needs. We need to understand what the basics are of organizational change management to make this happen. Frankly, OCM or organizational change management is deficient in a lot of organizations. So we can do a lot just by addressing that. And what we also want to do is based on understanding those human needs, we want to understand and know how to address, address some of the resistance to change that we might see when we're doing these types of initiatives as well. Then I'll talk about in, in a wrap up in terms of some of the things I like to do to really make sure that we're implementing lasting change and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and have Q&A after that. I've talked about this before, but it's very important to set the stage about uh, the types of things that we're talking about. In general, Companies are failing in their efforts to become data driven. We have more and more information. Companies are investing in more and more tools and technologies and everything else all the time, but we're actually failing. And in fact, we're actually regressing in the industry in terms of how we're really being able to utilize data. The percentage of firms identifying themselves as being data driven has actually declined in the last three years from 37.1% in 2017 down to 31% this year. And that's a fairly significant addition. Um, difference. And when we think about think about the money that companies are spending on things like big data, AI, and everything else, all aimed at making us better in this space, but it's actually making us worse in this space, or we're not being as effective as we can be. And this is right out of a Harvard Business Review study that was uh, published on February 5th of this year. In terms of surveying large industry leading corporations, what they really found is that 72% of, of participants didn't even have a data culture or what they considered a strong data culture in their organizations. 69% said they didn't have a data-driven organization. And over 50%, 53% say that they're not treating data as a business asset yet. 
that's something that we talk about, and not just myself, but other participants and speakers at conferences, these webcasts. We talk about how important data is to organizations and that it truly is a business asset, and we need to treat it that way. And again, over 50% admit that they're not competitive when they're using data and analytics in their organizations either. But here's the telltale stat. 93% of the respondents identify people and process issues as the obstacle that's really stopping them from succeeding in this area. And this is important. It's very difficult to institute cultural change in an organization. 40% identify that there's really a lack of organizational alignment. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit in terms of that strategic alignment in terms of what the company and the organization is about right through what you do throughout your entire business to make sure that everybody's doing things that are really contributing towards the end goal. And of course, there's cultural resistance. We as human beings, and I'm going to talk more about this as we go forward, resist change. Even though we say we're proponents of change, deep down, we tend to resist change and revert back to old behaviors unless we make a concerted effort to do so. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today as well. Now, to make for companies more competitive and better in this space, we really have to be able to be more serious and creative about how we actually address the human side of data. If we're going to have meaningful business benefits, we need to have lasting change rather than temporary change. And this study that these findings came out was a different one, which was the Big Data and AI Executive Summary from New Vantage Partners. So we're seeing different themes coming about from different studies, and the results are very consistent. In terms of how we're doing as organizations, very few organizations are really using information to its full potential. Yet another study, and this is the PwC Iron Mountain study that I've quoted a few times. This was done in 2015, and we're still seeing consistency from four years ago to today that we're really not gaining ground in these areas. Again, deficiencies in technical capabilities, skills, and lacking a data culture is one of the things that comes into play here. So again, we're talking about that human side of the equation. Lacking investment in value-driven information strategies also contributes to the problems. And deep down, a lot of organizations really don't know how to derive maximum value from the information they have. And if that continues, their corporate value is going to be eroded. So in the PwC Iron Mountain study, they actually had a couple of good char uh, characterizations of, of how they actually positioned organizations. They had a few, but I'm going to take the, both extremes of it. The one area they called the misguided majority. People were informed about data, but they were constrained in their abilities to use it. Or in other instances, they were uninformed and ill-equipped to use it altogether. A symptom of this is in a lot of companies, if data is seen as a byproduct or taken for granted, that really means that there's really a low com comprehension of what the commercial value is of that data and how you can really gain benefits in your organization. A lot of companies are constrained by legacy approaches and sometimes regulations, so they need to break out of those patterns if they're using legacy approaches to really embrace the new world and how they're going to use data. Weak analytic capabilities can be part of it, or maybe you have strong analytic capabilities, but you're just not focusing on the things that really drive value in the organization. In this day and age, another contributing factor is there's more and more data produced on a daily basis. We have internally produced data. We have externally produced data. We want more and more data from big data sources, uh, external and internal, uh, and that type of thing. So companies are simply overwhelmed by the data volume and don't know how to cope with what they have. So we need to get back to basics and really start addressing those things and actually concentrate on the right things. It's not how much data you have, it's how effectively you utilize the data that's important to your organizations. And of course, those that think data is the domain of data architects are doomed to failure. Data architects play an extremely important role, but we really need to institute business ownership of the data and make sure that everybody in the organization understands the data that they're utilizing and the importance of managing it correctly. Any type of governance efforts that are driven by IT rather than business-led are also suspect because you really need to make sure that the business is driving this. The business owns the data, the business makes the decisions on the data, so the business needs to take ownership of it. IT are the facilitators, but the business really needs to drive it. And this is often characterized by things like unintegrated systems, spreadsheet, hell, and that type of thing. So pulling together the type of information you need in your organization can be very difficult and sometimes impossible. Now let's look at the other end of the spectrum to what they called the information elite, which were the top 4% of companies that they were looking at. 
Very importantly is these organizations were extremely proactive in their utilization of data. They used data to diversify their business models. They used data to improve operating efficiencies in their organizations. And they also used data to identify and implement new market opportunities. That means that you not only have a good handle on what your data is, you know how to analyze it, and you have a measurement system in place so that you know that you're making improvements. This ties into my next point, and that is tangible data value. So what they're doing is they're actually taking what are the important key performance indicators for the business, and they're linking data value and how they can drive those key performance indicators back to the data itself. They're exploiting the data for competitive advantage. And they also have a balanced approach. We all know in today's regulatory uh, environment and just privacy in general, even if we didn't have the regulations, that we need to protect information. So they have a very balanced approach between recognizing the security requirements, but also making sure that the right data is available to the right people to extract the business value that they need from it. And this is extremely important again. It comes right back into the culture or the fabric of the organization. They have a very holistic approach. Governance isn't something that's added on. It's not just an extra program or that type of thing. It's just a part of normal business. It's woven right into the fabric of the organization. And of course, to do these types of things means that we really need to be addressing that human side of the equation and make sure everybody is working together. The other thing, of course, is that you have a well-defined information strategy, and that's reflected and aligned to the business objectives of the organization as well. Just a step back, this is something that I always talk about, but I always like to position in terms of what do we really need to do to be able to drive data governance? It's not something that happens all by itself. Governance is extremely ineffective unless it's supported by a comprehensive and unified enterprise architecture in the organization. And to do that, we need to do several things. First, as a foundation, we need a very solid data architecture. Everything that we do is has some representation in, in data in our organizations. That in turn supports the, the central pillar, which is business architecture. And that means what we do in our organization, our strategies, our goals, our objectives, our business processes and how they work together, how we utilize the data in the execution of those business processes. And I'm talking the full cycle, create, read, update, and delete. So what that gives us is what our business is about, what we're doing, what our strategic goals are, and the data that we utilize and produce to, to, to allow us to go along the way. That is flanked by the application architecture in terms of the applications that we have deployed to allow us to do this, and the technical architecture, which is the infrastructural types of components that enable us to, to, to do this in our organizations. Having all those pieces in balance is what really helps us to drive out enterprise enablement. Once we've done that, that's when we really have a solid foundation where we can build governance on top of that. I've talked about data and process maturity in the past, and I'm just going to do a quick review of this. Really, when you look at your organizations, what I've got here is I've got a few basic categories and just some types of things that you can look at to help you position as to where you may fit in the, on the terms of the data maturity scale. This is based on the capability maturity model. There's now the data maturity model and those types of things. They're typically a one to five scale, but I actually even use a zero on data maturity because there are some organizations which are still managed by chaos and really don't have a handle on their, or, on their organizational data. What I want you to get out of it for this presentation is not the technical aspects of this in terms of what types of master data management uh, capabilities and those types of things we have in place, but you really wanna look at the behavioral aspects of the organization. And what we see at the bottom end of the scale is like I said, we often see chaos, we see companies that are unaware of the importance of data, or they actually deny that data is important. As you start moving up the scale, you see things like more of a chaotic environment where there's some recognition of the importance of data, but it's not well managed. And as you progress up the scale, you move through chaotic, reactive. Finally, you get to a point where you have a really stable, standardized environment where things are starting to come together. You're driving KPIs with the data. But when you get to the top end of the scale, that's when you're really proactive and you're also able to do predictive analytics and those types of things based on the data that you have in your organization. It's extremely important to be able to do these types of things. And what this means is we need to motivate and get everybody in the organization on board doing this, the right things with the data and making sure that they're managing the data correctly, all under the umbrella of data governance. A very important thing to look at here as well is how we can actually see where we might fit on the scale. 
If your organization is primarily focused on technology and infrastructure, you're probably towards the low end of the scale. But if you're really focused more on the on information and strategic business enablement with data, then you're very likely towards the higher end of the scale. Combined with that is the values as well. So if you're at the low end of the scale, you actually are introducing high risk in your organization, using the wrong data for the wrong things or making the wrong decisions off of data. Whereas when you have this woven into the fabric and you're confident in the data that you have, you have a much lower level of risk. The counterpart of that or the other side of that coin is the value generation. At a low level of data maturity, you have very low value generation and probably a lot of inefficiency in your organizations. And if you are at a high level of data maturity, you have a high level of value generation in, in, in your business as well. I'm not going to belabor this point, but again, when we think of data architecture, we think of modeling data and those types of things as well. There's a direct correlation between data maturity and, and the presence of data modeling and utilizing modeling in the organization. At the low end of the scale, you may not be doing data modeling or you may be doing it just to document after the fact. Whereas at the top end of the scale, you've got a fully integrated program where you're doing integrated modeling, you have business glossaries and metadata, and you're driving self-serve analytics in the organization, all based on the common metadata that comes out of these modeling initiatives. On the other side of the coin, I want to talk about process. Same type of thing. It's that, that central core. We have a number of things here that we're talking about in terms of different categories that we can use when we look at some of these qualitative factors to say, where do we fit from a process maturity perspective when we look at these different categories? But again, it's the same type of thing. You get to the point where it is rather chaotic and there's a lot of inconsistency in that type of thing. As you move up to the scale to more managed and standardized, you're finding things like, uh, you know, people understanding what they do, repeatable work. Uh, and when you get up to the far end of the scale, you're really working more like a well-oiled machine where you've got continuous improvement in place. You're always looking at your processes. You have a benchmark of what your current state are. You're actually using modeling and anal analysis to determine how you're going to change and optimize those processes again, to drive more value through the organization. From a systems perspective, again, what you often find in this is at the bottom end, you often have a lot of disparate, disconnected IT systems. And as you start moving across, you start taking more of a services-based approach where you have types of services adoption when you're in a managed to full service adoption when you're in more of a standardized env environment to the point where you get to things like service-oriented architected and real truly business process-driven enterprises as well. That combined with a data mature a high level of data maturity is really what enables the organizations the same types of things as I talked about on on the data side of things again at the low end of the scale you're going to find a low level of productivity and quality in your organization whereas at the high end of the process maturity scale you're going to be having high productivity and high quality of process in your organizations the same thing with risk and waste at the bottom end you have high risk and high waste and at the top end you have low risk and low waste Symptoms to look at in your organizations as well is if you think if the, the basic philosophy in your organization is still focused on things like primarily cost cutting in terms of how to gain efficiencies, rather than really looking at value generation in the organization, chances are that you're trending towards the lower end of the process maturity scale. If you see just in general that your environment is very chaotic in terms of a management perspective versus a really highly tuned uh, leadership driven organization, at the top end of the scale, those are things that you can characterize as well. I'm not going to go through all the points here, but again, I like to include these slides. I know I've, I've used them in past presentations, and people really like to have this as kind of a uh, as a reference to look at after the fact. From a process point of view, the same type of thing. To manage our processes, we really need to understand them, and we need to design our processes. So if you're using process modeling just for documenting after the fact, you're probably trending towards the lower end of the process maturity, but if you're really using it to do things like drive out business process management and then really drive out process improvement as you move up the scale, you get to the point where you're doing process design and going to fully mature types of uh, initiatives like Six Sigma for quality and everything else. That usually is where you'll find your organization at the top end of the process scale. Last part about this before we get into the really true human factor side of things. And that is, of course, that top of that structure that I showed you is the data governance. We want these other things to be in balance and drive a high level of data and process maturity. But then we really need to look at data governance as well. Governance is hard work. And there are too many people that think that they can go out and buy a solution and it's implemented data governance. 
It doesn't work that way. It's extremely hard. You need the data and process maturity there, and you can't accomplish true data governance without the right people doing the right thing. And what that really means is that you need to focus on process, people, culture, and technology as an enabler, but the primary focus and that we're gonna talk about today is the people, the processes, and the culture that are extremely important. You can buy all the tools in the world, but unless you're focusing on the people and the processes and driving that culture in the organization, you will fail. You really need to focus on the human side of the equation. To do all of this, I've talked about this and I'm not going to go through this in, in great detail, but again, from business alignment, most organizations that are truly mature have things like vision statements. In other words, what does this organization want to be? Like, how does it see itself changing the world? They drive that down into mission statements in terms of what it is that they try to do every day and, and, and really drive that out to motivate the people that are working for the organization as well as their business partners that they work with in terms of vendors, customers, and the other thing. Based off of that, your business strategy is aligned to those goals and objectives. And then from our perspective, when we start talking about data strategy and governance and data management and those types of things, we still want to have all of those pieces aligned to that data strategy. Everything that we're doing should be helping the business to accomplish its goals and objectives. And that means what we're really using is we're using the data strategy and data management practice and governance to deliver really the types of things that the company needs to put into place the data quality and everything else to help the company enable its goals. So now let's look at the people side of the problem. And this is where we're gonna spend some time now. I think most of you have probably heard of uh, Tony Robbins. Anthony Robbins is uh, kind of what he went by in his earlier days. So either one, he's a basically a self-help self expert and he really understands people. He's a motivational speaker and he has a lot of very good insights. So I'm gonna talk about some of the things that uh, Tony talks about today. What you really need to understand is that we really need to overcome human nature. People will tend to drift back to what they're accustomed to. So we, it's a constant battle to institute effective, lasting change. Each individual we, needs to be motivated to move forward. So if we look at this, let's look at some of the things that happen. 92% of the 17 million that try to quit smoking each year fail. 95% of people who lose weight fail to keep it off long term. 88% of people who set New Year's resolutions fail at their attempt. And only 10% of the population has specific, well-defined goals. But even if they do, only seven out of 10 of those people reach their goals half the time. Across the board, that's a very low success rate. So if we have trouble accomplishing what we want to do for ourselves, imagine how hard it is for us to accomplish what we want to do when people are trying to do things like impose change on us and that type of thing. The results are even worse. So what we really need to do as organizations, as agents of change in our organizations for governance and those types of things, is we really need to understand what motivates people and how can we help them to make sure that they overcome this human nature, which is to backslide into their previous level of behavior. So that's, we're gonna talk about some of that today as well. We need to continually manage change in our organizations to keep people on track. Now, according to Tony Robbins, there are actually two forces that motivate people avoidance of pain and gaining pleasure. So basically unpleasant versus pleasant things. Generally speaking, avoiding pain actually is the more, more powerful motivator, but you don't want to use that unless you have to. You don't want to walk around carrying a big stick and try to force people to do things that they don't want because they may do it to overcome the short term pain, but then they'll just backslide into this other behavior. So we still want to look at ways that we can actually have lasting change. Think of another analogy that's not to do with work or anything like that. If we take this avoid playing or gain pleasure type of thing, think about back to a childhood. I don't know about uh, how you were, but I know when I was a kid and I wanted to go out and play with my friends, if my room wasn't cleaned, I'm sorry, I had to get that done first before I was able to go out and play with my friends. So you can actually look at that as playing two sides of the equation at the same time. It's the pain of not being able to go out, but you're motivated to get rid of that, but you're also gained for the benefit of going out and playing with your friends. So you're gonna clean your room or, or whatever else the other types of things are that you have to do so that you're able to do that. And if we look at approaches in business that actually play to both sides of this, that can be very effective as well. Now, interestingly enough, people do yo-yo back and forth and we can see it on the stuff on the left-hand side of the page. 
So you see this seesaw effect where people basically take, take change, it's going great, and then it starts to fizzle out, and then they basically are kind of overcome by inaction. So we need to keep breaking that cycle to get people out of that. And change is never a matter, matter of ability. It's a matter of motivation. So we need to constantly motivate people to be their best and really change for the better. That's easier said than done, but it's something that we want to try to drive at. Again, from Tony Robbins, I want to talk about some basic things that he talks about, because this is very important in terms of if we were going to bring together an effective team for governance initiatives or, frankly, any kinds of change that we're trying to affect in our organizations, we really need to understand what makes people tick. So there are six core human needs that we're going to talk about here today, but some of them are tightly tied together. So if we look at the first under personality, which is a broad category, there's the, the, there's the concept of certainty. In other words, the need for things like safety, stability, security, comfort, and, you know, that can include things like order and, or predictable circumstances and the ability to have control and consistency in what you're doing versus variety in terms of the need for variety. In other words, challenges, excitement, being able to do different things, a sense of adventure, you know, a sense of change and, and novelty and those types of things. They're not diametric opposed, but you need to have a balance between the two. And that varies by individual about which end of the spectrum they're going to be on as well. But you need to recognize that these are things that motivate individuals and how they work and they are needs of the personality. The other part of the personality aspect of it is, is things like significance or something that's referred to as love and connection. Now, when we look at that, what we're really looking at there is from significance, you need to want to feel like you're a significant person, whether that means in your relationships, or are significant to your organization, you want to feel needed, you want to feel pride in what you're doing, you want to feel a sense of importance, and you want to feel that you're a worthy contributor, whether it's in relationships or in your workday. The other side of that is the love and connection. You want to be communicating and you want to be connected to other people. You want a sense of an approval and you want to be, you know, understood and, and build friendships with, with other human beings. We're social creatures by, ha by nature, so we need to make sure that we're nurturing that side of the equation as well. And these play into really driving out and building a good team to be able to do these types of things. The last category that he talks about is spirit needs. And this is really things that are building on top of, of the things that we have from the basic personality needs as well. So what we're talking about there is growth and contribution. We all, we all want to feel that we're growing on our daily journey, and that means that we're going to have constant emotional growth, intellectual growth, and spiritual development of some sense. We also want to feel that we are contributing, whether that means contributing to our organization, contributing to others, you know, giving back to society, all of those factors tie in. So what we really want to do when we're looking at things in organizations is we want to understand this is how people work, and we want to make sure that we're tying into people's sense of well-being, belonging in teams, and having everybody work together. Now, this stuff isn't new. Uh, those of you that are in management are probably going to go, okay, I can't believe you brought this one up, but we have to. This is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and this is where a lot of management and psychology theory came from. Maslow's original paper was actually done in 1943. It was called Theory of Human Motivation, and then he actually published a book 11 years later, which was called Motivation and Personality. It's very important to understand what motivates people from this perspective as well. And he viewed it as basically a pyramid or a hierarchy of needs that, that we build upon. So at the bottom, it's our basic physiological needs that we need as human beings. And that's things like everything from air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and that type of thing. And generally, you need to be taking care of things at the lower level before you're really going to be paying as much attention as you need to the things at the higher level. So once you've got that, you're looking at things like safety needs. So that's where you're looking at things like health, security, employment, you know, resources and property that we think of, up to love and belonging. And that's obviously friendship, intimacy, family, connection, you know, into your families, your coworkers, that type of thing. And of course, most of us take a lot of satisfaction in our jobs and the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis as well. So the esteem portion is very important as well as we start building up this pyramid in terms of respect, our self-esteem, the status that we hold, recognition for what we're doing by others, the strength and the freedom to do things that we think we need to be able to do to actually develop as individuals 
And at the top of the pyramid is what Maslow really said that people are driving at, is they're really trying to drive at self-actualization, that is really becoming the most that one can be in their, in their daily lives. Now, when we look at this, we have to think about this very seriously because as we're going through and we're making changes, we want to make sure that we're not interfering with a person's needs to establish these types of things or we're going to encounter resistance. So I'm going to talk about that in the context of organizational change management next. First, what is organizational change management? Simply stated, it's a framework for managing the effect of new business processes, changes in organizational structure, or cultural changes within an enterprise. OCM addresses the people side of change management. I think you can see now where we're talking about the importance of process maturity and that type of thing as well, because how can you change processes and that type of thing if you don't truly understand what they are and how they work in the first place? So even that ties directly into this. For effective organizational change management, you need several things. And of course, I'm talking about this in the context of data governance, but it really applies to any kind of organizational change that you're trying to implement. You need a common vision for that change. And that usually starts with strong executive leadership to communicate what that vision is, but that also means strong people throughout the organization to continue that communication and making sure that that vision is implemented people that buy into where you're going and really help along the way. It's truly a teamwork approach. Education is extremely important. You need a strategy for educating employees and other stakeholders. There are many diverse stakeholder groups in an organization. So you can't just come out with like a standard presentation that says, here's what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. Quite often you will need to have strategy that's tailored for different groups in the organization because that shows that you understand what their role in the organization is and really how they can make the best out of these changes. So a good organizational change management plan is tailored for the different areas of the business. It's not a one size fit all, fits all attempt. Obviously to understand how you're evolving along this path of change that you're trying to put in is you want metrics and a plan of how you're going to measure your success and make sure that you're achieving your objectives. What you also want, because things do happen, is you want to have contingency plans and extremely important is a communication plan. It is virtually impossible to over communicate. And this is where most organizations fail is, they, is a failure to communicate in the things that they're doing. I had a very interesting discussion with somebody about uh, OCM a while back and, and they didn't really understand why, why people weren't getting in line for their data governance program and why it was so hard to implement. And they said, we thought we did all the right things. We have a governance newsletter that tells everybody what we're doing and that type of thing. Newsletters are great, but they're a supplemental communication tool. You should never use a newsletter to break the news about what it's going to be. What you really want to have is you want to have that education and training in place. And then you want to supplement it with things like newsletters to celebrate successes, report on progress, and really help to build that team momentum. A newsletter on its own is not a communication plan. It's just an accessory that helps you drive it home. Something that's also very important is there's a lot of change that tends to happen in these, these initiatives, and it can be a lot of hard work for people and everything else. So make sure that you're really encouraging the stakeholders to take the ownership. And the way you do that is by rewarding people in their groups on a personal basis. There can be many different things that happen there. 70% of organizational change initiatives fail. And generally speaking, it's because of the lack of communication and the, and the lack of strong executive leadership. A combination of those two are probably the two largest things that contribute to failure of organizational change management. So on that light, how can this fail? So I'm going to talk about now about what are some of the types of factors that can cause people to resist that change. First and foremost is uncertainty. If people don't understand what you're doing or what the initiative is about, they're going to dig in their heels because, you know, they'd rather live with the devil they know than something that is unknown. And so they'll actually take something that's bad over the unknown until they can understand what it's all about. So what you really need to do to make sure that you, you remediate that is when you're putting a process together for how you're going to affect this change, it needs to be clear, concise steps with timetables and a very open environment based on trust. Everybody needs to be encouraged to communicate their questions and their concerns, and you need to respond in a timely manner. So again, there's that part of that communication strategy, but there's constant communication back and forth to make this happen. 
people fear loss of control. If people think their jobs are going to change or it's going to affect their autonomy and how they do their jobs, they're going to resist change. The way around this is not to drop change on people. It's to invite them into the planning to begin with so they can have a sense of ownership and they can feel that they're helping to shape the change that they're at. And once you've got those people on board and they're helping to shape that change, there's nothing better than a convert to help you roll that out into other areas of the organization as well. Surprise is extremely important as well. If something's just imposed on them without warning, it's basically lock the brakes and they're going to stop until they know what's going on. Same type of thing. Communicate in advance, solicit input. It can be the greatest thing in the world that you're trying to do, but if you drop a surprise on people, they're going to react to, to it in a negative fashion just because that's human nature until they truly understand what's going on. Change overload, and this is something as well. Sometimes people try to do too many changes at once. They like to do a full new program or a whole new way of doing things. And basically you overwhelm the stakeholders with the level of change that's occurring. So what you really wanna do is you wanna minimize that. You wanna do what's important. You wanna do it in a good sequence, but if there are unrequired changes, don't do them. Or if there are th they may round things out later on, but defer things that aren't that important to later on in the process until people have adjusted to the change that you're trying, the major focus of change first. Loss of face is another one. And this one is kind of interesting. This happens if people think the change really impacts something that they own. So maybe I implemented something in the organization, a new program or something like that. Now this data governance program comes along and it looks like it totally contradicts what I've just implemented. So I may feel hurt by that. I may think, geez, did I not do a good job? Was management unhappy with me? Do people not like me anymore? So it brings up all these types of feelings that may feel the, make the person feel defensive, even if they don't really need to feel defensive. So what you really need to do is, if you're gonna change something that somebody has had a really had a hand in implementing the program or whatever it is that you're going to change, Celebrate the positive benefits of what they've done in their efforts. And again, include them in the planning so you can do it like say building on what they've actually invented. It's like, Joey, you did a great job here. Let's take it to the next step now and include them in the planning so we can actually morph what they've done and help take it to the next step where we need the organization to go. Peer pressure is extremely important. Again, people are social by nature. If you, if, they, if a group within an organization feels threatened or any stakeholder group, if they feel threatened, they're going to, the, or that group or the existence of that group is threatened, people again are going to dig in their heels and they're going to resist that change. You can't underestimate this. People feel a need of belonging. So the need to belong to a group is extremely powerful. So again, involve that group in the planning. There's another aspect of peer pressure that's actually very important as well, and that is if you can get the majority of group on board, but there are some other individuals in the group that aren't quite on board yet, just by fa the fact that you get the majority of that group on board, then that peer pressure works the other way where those people will start to influence the, the people that are lagging to really uh, take, take the initiative by hold and endorse it as well. So you can use that both ways. Loss of self-confidence is huge, is huge. And what that really means is if you're putting through a lot of change, sometimes people might feel that they don't have the necessary skills to adjust to the proposed change. And that can be a real threat. And of course, that really starts to attack down at those lower levels in the, in the organization. So what you need to do there is you really need to have detailed and complete communication. And that means education, training, mentorship and support. You have to realize where people are at their own level evolutions and the types of role that they play in the organization. And you need to chart a path or a plan that involves all of these things on the right hand side to bring them forward to where you need them to be to really make them feel really comfortable in that. Now let's think about this as well. If people get really threatened by this, it could actually sabotage or, or compromise an entire change in issues and you don't want to let that happen. Extra work always comes along. Anytime we're implementing change in an organization, quite often the first thing, question people ask is, what's that gonna to do to my daily workload? Because I'm already overloaded as is. I don't know anybody that I've worked with over the past several years 
that doesn't have enough to do. Most of us are overloaded and we're working all out day in, day out. So people can perceive additional changes as just extra work. It causes them stress. They can be difficult to accommodate. So we need to mitigate that. If changes do add additional work in the near term, that means we need to provide resources to help with that, even if it means redeploying or resources from other areas or bringing people in to augment what's happening in the organization as change agents to help make this happen. It may mean temporary assignments, but all participants should be rewarded for their efforts as well, because we need to recognize that they are taking on extra things and we need to reward them accordingly. There's also a ripple effect. Change in one area can actually cause disruption in other areas. And that's not just restricted to inside our organizations. It can impact other organizations, our customers, our vendors, and those types of things. So when we're looking at putting our plans together, we really need to make sure that we're looking beyond the organization's walls into everyone else that is impacted as well. Again, we have to work with those parties to minimize the disruption, communicate, and solicit their input in terms of how we can minimize the impact on them as well. This one is a tough one, and I call it old wounds, and that's really ghosts of the past are likely to surface during times of change. If I did something six months ago, two years ago, four years ago that caused somebody some pain or maybe what I did wasn't received well, if I'm now in charge of another initiative, bang, just like that, those old wounds will open up and, and people will go back to say, oh, you did this to me four years ago, now you're doing it to me again, as an example. So what we really need to do is, if we have had circumstances like that happen, we need to find ways to heal those wounds of the past first, and then start to transition into this future initiative in a very positive manner. So what that means is a lot of introspection by the senior management team and the people that are leading the change to begin with, and that is, you know, what are the things that we've done? What, what does our change record look like over the last several years? What's worked for us? What hasn't worked for us? What could we have done better? And just to make sure that we're actually mitigating that as we move forward with our teams. And again, this one is, it's all too real. Change can cause significant pain. Not necessarily on a governance program, but in other types of change, there can be significant things that go on. And it could include things like loss of jobs or reassignment of roles or that type of thing. And people perceive that as real, as real pain. So what you really have to do there is you have to be honest about it to the people that are impacted. You have to be very transparent in terms of what the plan is. And you have to be very fair of how you deal with them. It's like pulling off a Band-Aid. You also want to do it as expediently as possible. You really have to do that. And uh, again, it's all about the people management side of things. Unfortunately, there are going to be some things that you can't address, but the idea is that you need to be able to address absolutely as much as possible. And this one is really bad. And this is really rooted in an organized his organization's history. If your organization, for whatever reason, has kind of a climate of mistrust, it's going to be extremely difficult to overcome that to put forth any kind of change initiatives. Organizational change just will not work at a climate of mistrust. So it'll be doomed and it's fragile and it's extremely difficult to prepare. And the only thing I can say is you may not be able to embark on these changes as soon as you think. You need to spend a lot of time mending, rebuilding those fences, as it were, and rebuild that trust in your organization amongst the stakeholder groups and the individuals so that the team really feels that they're in a trusted, open environment and transparent environment to really allow these types of things to succeed. Those companies at the mature end of the scale do this. It's just part of their daily culture they do in day in and day out. So how do we use this to implement lasting change? Obviously, we need to have defined targets, and I've kind of talked about that. So and in terms of data governance programs, we want to say, what are the areas that are important to us? How do we want to lay them out? And what is our plan? And obviously, how are we going to measure against that plan? So we're going to break it down into small, sustainable changes. I've used this analogy before. As most of you know, I am a pilot, so I like to use aviation analogies. I like to use the phrase, plan the flight, fly the plan. And that includes things like planning out your entire flight, your alternates or your contingencies and that type of thing, and then you execute what you've already planned. So if unforeseen circumstances come up, you've already thought about it and you already have a plan for how you're going to address it. Oops. Without the plan, the chance of success is virtually zero. And of course, as I've said before, and it's, you know, hope is not a strategy. You really have to make sure that you're 
looking at this and measuring it all the way through. Again, using the flying analogy, if I have this flight plan, I'm measuring my, plan, my progress against every leg of this plan and my contingencies against every leg of that plan as well. Change needs to be concrete, and that means it needs to be measurable, and we need to use a continuous improvement approach. Big Bang typically doesn't work for these types of initiatives. We want to grow into it. We want to make sure that we're training the people and, and looking after their needs and that type of thing. We want to evaluate, measure, and adjust as we keep going forward, and then keep adding additional changes in small increments at a pace that the organization is able to absorb. And finally, back to the data governance angle here, data governance is hard work. There's no getting around it. The information capability in organizations is poor and declining, as I saw, as I mentioned on the opening slides, and this directly impacts our data governance efforts. We really need to address that human side to, to get traction on this. Organizations that are successful with governance, they have a higher data maturity that we've talked about, they have a higher level of process maturity, and they achieve alignment between business strategy, which is their mission, values, and goals, their data strategy, and their data governance. And they implement lasting change, and they measure it using quantifiable metrics to measure the success. And they can't do any of it without taking care of this human side or the human side of the equation. So we really need to make sure that we concentrate on that. What we really need to do is we need to motivate people, sorry. That, and what that means is we can't be chasing technology. For governance, we need to understand what motivates the people. We need to overcome that resistance to change. And that means a common vision, strong leadership, a climate of trust. We need to remove that uncertainty. It needs to be a teamwork focus and focusing on ongoing education and a reward system that really rewards the people that are doing that. And very important, your role as an agent of change is to constantly communicate and facilitate to ensure that that change occurs. That's it for the uh, formal part of the uh, session. So with that, Shannon, I'll turn it over to you and we'll open it up for questions. Ron, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. I was thinking to myself as you were going through it, I'm like, oh, how many people can I send this to? Um... <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> it's so helpful. It's really great. I just love it. And uh, I, thanks to all the attendees for um, being so engaged throughout. Uh, just a reminder for, to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording for this presentation. And if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And I will start digging in here, Ron, because we have had questions coming in throughout. Um, uh, for the process maturity table on slide nine, where is this published and what is the data collection tool to evaluate these process elements? Uh, well, in terms of where, where, where that, where that um, on page nine, if we're looking at the actual process maturity slide, there are a lot of qualitative factors there. So obviously they will have, they will have the slide in the deck that comes out. So they'll, they'll have this for reference when we, when we publish this out. But in terms of collecting the types of metrics, the, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this. What I've done here in my, in my, in my uh, slide is I've actually listed qualitative factors. So you can actually look at any one of these things. And if you see this type of behavior in your organization, it's usually a pretty good indicator of that's where you might fit in that particular part on the grid when you look at it in your organization. So there, you can also go through more formal quantifiable process assessments and data maturity assessments on the, on the data side of things. I wanted to just have a table of qualitative factors that you can look at. So I think you want to start with something qualitative like this to get a good feel for where you fit, but then by all means, follow it up with more detailed process assessments and data assessments in your organizations that drill down into the lower level details. Perfect. So on a Addressing resistance, how would you tackle the situation where people have received financial reward from, an, uh, from a supplier and therefore will try to protect what has been done? Ah, uh -huh. well, it's very interesting and that goes right into the overall corporate culture. Most of the organizations that I've worked for over the last several years really have tried to be good corporate citizens. So generally speaking, those organizations actually ban taking any kind of a reward or incentive from any suppliers that you do business with, just so there is no conflict of interest. 
If your organization happens to be of a climate where people do take incentives from suppliers, it is extremely difficult to manage because basically what you're doing now is, let's say it's a financial reward and this is going away. Well, guess what? Now you're actually starting to impact one of those lower levels of that Maslow's hierarchy. So they're going to dig their heels in really hard because you're really affecting their, their ability to, to exist. Now, having said that, the responsibility of that is on the senior leadership of the organization that actually allowed that circumstance to exist in the first place. So that's where you need that senior leadership team to make sure that they amend their policies and procedures and prevent those types of things from happening in the future. That was long-winded, but I hope that helped. <laughs> Oh, it was great. It was fantastic. You know, I, I think it's a it's a common problem. Um, <clears throat> is a, a CDO uh, uh, is it a beating position responsible for all data swamps and chaos and integration? There's no quick victory. Um, it's oh, is a CDO a kamikaze? <laughs> That's what the question is. Is the CDO a kamikaze? Yeah. Uh, is it a beating no. position? <laughs> Interesting, and, and of course, people just like to ask this, so I get on my soapbox, I think, but uh, the CDO is a very essential role, and it really is a replacement of what should have been the CIO. When we first instituted CIOs in organizations, Chief Information Officer was the title, but what we've actually found in many organizations is a lot of CIOs come from a technical background, or they've been saddled with a lot of technical responsibilities. So quite often we find them looking after more things like the application architectures and the technical architecture, and they may not be that well grounded in data or business architecture at all. So to have that business ownership of the data, that's where the CDO role came from. The CDO needs to be somebody that's entrenched in the business and it is a business function, and they have the overall responsibility for the governance of the data in the organization. And Ron, what is the best way to define KPIs that align to the business goals? Again, it really depends on your business. So your business is going to have some some specific things that they need to be able to do. And I know I did this on, on, a, on a presentation on business value metrics at one point in time. So if I'm things like a manufacturer, for instance, I'm going to have all kinds of metrics that show how well, how efficient and how well my uh, my business is doing. I'm going to have focus, customer focus measures in terms of speed of delivery, quality of service, and all those types of things. So I'm going to stand up measurements that allow me to measure how well I'm succeeding at that. Well, internally, I'm going to be looking at things like how fast is my inventory turnover? What's my bill of material accuracy? What are my scrap rates? And, and, and what are my targets to reduce scrap and improve efficiency on my manufacturing floor? What we want to make sure of is when we tie in our, our KPIs for our data management programs and our governance programs, really the underlying premise here is your governance program should allow you to do things like improve your quality of data, and you should see that manifest itself by improvements in achieving those same business metrics. And how do you keep leadership focused um, to continue support of your projects while at the same time moving on to the next big thing in an agile company? Well, that's an interesting thing because too many companies have a very short-term project-based uh, uh, focus. Governance is not a project. It's not a short-term thing. Governance is a long-term program that needs to exist forever. The goals and objectives are going to continue to change as you make your way along the journey of governance, but it's always going to be there. So they always need to be looking forward in terms of if you're in an agile environment, similar to how you do in development, things like that, where you have your sprint planning sessions and you're laying out your development changes and things like that, you should be doing the same types of things in your governance initiatives. It's like, here's how we've succeeded and how far we've come to this point in time. What's our next set of milestones? What are the next things that we want to try to achieve? So they should always be looking forward in terms of what are the next things they need to achieve to bring themselves up that scale. So, uh, Ron, people react poorly to data governance often and the check-in and clearance on the use of the data, including the data governance protocol, steals from, quote unquote, steals from their authority and autonomy for doing the things that they should be able to do. Suggestions for dealing with that? Well, the important thing is, and this is where the, where the high-performing organizations do very well, is they understand the balance of the need for data security and privacy 
with the need to be able to make the right decision. So that means that you, you make the, the right data available to the right people to make those decisions. There are going to be instances where you perceive that it is something you need, but it may not be something that you need. So maybe when you're looking at certain things, uh, let, let's take certain information in a certain database. Maybe you need something about the customers, but that doesn't mean you, you need unfettered access to the customer data. Maybe there are only portions of that customer data that you need. So it really is up to the people that are managing the governance and, and the stewards involved to say, here's the types of information that are needed for these different areas and give people access to the portion that they need rather than the whole thing. It's hard work, like I said, there's no, there's no silver bullet, but it really means understanding your organization, the data, and how it's utilized in the organization. It really is. You know, I, again, I've seen this a lot in other companies. I volunteer for a nonprofit, and I can't tell you how timely this is. Um, <laughs> any suggestions on how to tell leadership that they are asking too much uh, change once at once and are focused on technology, not business people? Send me copies of my webcast. I don't know. I'm just... <laughs> I guess, I guess just, just, continue, just continue with the message. And uh, really the way to do that is, you know, you may, don't go it alone. I mean, if you're feeling that way in your organization, there are probably other people in your organization that feel the same way. So, you know, put together discussion groups and that type of thing. You know, invite the, uh, the, the leadership of the organization to have sort of a roundtable discussion and those types of things just to keep the dialogue going. Now, in an ideal organization, the leadership would, gener would, ge would basically keep the door open and generate that dialogue. But just because they haven't done that, that doesn't mean that you can't actually initiate the dialogue and the conversations yourself. I love it. And Ron, we get this next question quite a bit um, and would love to hear your pitch on this. You know, how do you change the mind of leadership that data governance is important to align to the bottom line? I think what you need to do is you need to show how implementing governance will actually improve some things that are important to the business. And, and I've, I've done a presentation on this in, in the past in terms of the, the business value metrics. So if you know, for instance, that uh, increasing sales by, say, 10% a year is important to the organization, show an example or put together a business case saying, if we do this, it's going to have, we feel that it's going to have this level of impact on our on our business sales to so really put it into uh, into business terms that th that those people can understand from their own area I love it. So I think we have time for to slip in one more question here. I was in the process of doing data governance on a project with the intent of using the process developed in that project for other projects. Does that work out well in your experience? Generally speaking, yes, because if you're, if you're doing it in a project, I mean, obviously you want to get it to a point where it's organization-wide, but a lot of companies kind of start in one area. So again, smart, small, start small and, and grow out from there. So what you want to do is you may have put in a process for this one project. The core of that process hopefully is sound. But what, what happens is you can start to adapt that if, if not. So every project or every initiative that you apply that to is going to be a learning experience. So don't feel that you're going to take that, at, you know, as basically a one size fits all and say it worked over here, so therefore it must work over there. It's like this process worked on this original initiative. I think it will work for the next one, but we may have to modify it some work. And, and by the end of it, if you're open to modifying it as you go along, you're going to come up with a better overall process to begin with. And that's how those mature organizations do it. They're always consistently evaluating what are we doing? How can we make it better on a continuous improvement approach? Well, Ron, thank you so much. That brings us almost to the top of the hour here. This has been another fantastic presentation, really helpful, very informative. Um, I think there's lessons here for everybody that we can all take away and use and, and help to make all your lives better. Um, and thanks, Idira, for sponsoring. And thanks to our community for everything and being so engaged in everything we do and, all, and helping each other out. Just love it. Uh, and there was a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and... Uh, and everything else. Ron, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. You too.